bodies everywhere. He harries the north, he destroys everything in sight, and he enforces his will on the north of England. The Bolin Valley lies about nine miles from Manchester, a tranquil and ancient landscape that has produced Bronze Age artefacts, Roman treasures, and stray finds that suggest the area was important to prehistoric hunters as long ago as 10,000 BC. Two Celtic tribes, the Brigantes and Canovi, coexisted here and left their mark, a faint echo of human activity revealed through crop features and earthworks, and occasionally something more bizarre. We're here in a perfectly ordinary front garden in Dunham Woodhouses. And when the elderly gentleman who lived here 10 years ago was burying a deceased cat in the front garden, uh, he came down upon this rather spooky looking face gazing back out of the hole at him. And uh, really interesting, this is one of the finest Celtic stone heads that I've seen recovered anywhere in recent years. It really is superb. With his little pointy chin and Celtic moustache, He's got this long, slender face, and he has these two protrusions here, these bumps, which look very similar to the local Celtic deity, Sununos. He's amazing. These things lay on the back, gazing up into the sky, and very often mark the positions of human burials, even though at this time he was 18 inches below modern-day ground level. But there's another lesson here as well. That elderly gentleman who I spoke to 10 years ago passed away seven years ago. And had he not told me the story of this head, that story would have been lost. It's incredibly important that we record things like this while we still can. Many spend their days passively searching for something interesting to do. Others dig in and find it. While nothing is certain, anything is possible. And the anticipation leads you into action. Because it's here that adventures begin. Stories are unearthed, secrets are revealed, fortunes are found, mysteries are solved, and the past is brought to life. Nothing valued is ever lost. It's simply waiting to be discovered. So here's the question. What are you looking for?
Good evening. It's Thursday. It's eight o'clock and it's the Big Detecting Show. Welcome back, everybody. Still not quite got my uh, normal awake face back on after the weekend's three, three hour shows. But here we are. And sadly, we won't have Adrian alongside us today because Adrian's been uh, family malarkey with his uh, so. We're not with him tonight, but uh, thoughts are with, with Adrian anyway. Hope everything's gone well today, as best that can anyway. But uh, here we are, uh, back again. And it's uh, I've been absolutely manic busy this week. You wouldn't believe it. I, I've got a few, not many this week, because not many people have given me any announcements. But one in particular, uh, the company behind Air Detectors have contacted me and told me that they are about to start shipment of the um, air detector to the people who signed up on the Patreon type thing that they did. And uh, I, I don't know why, I can't remember what the levels was. You're talking nearly two years, well, two years ago since that started. So I can't remember what the le- levels are. But for those of you who uh, did sign up to the Patreon for air detectors, uh, I'm more or less assured that they will be with you in the coming weeks. And that's all the uh, that I have there anyway. So I'm going to move on to this week's metal detecting news, if you all don't mind. I hate being on my own without uh, Adrian, but uh, thankfully I've got Mark Ollie with me tonight. So there you go. So in this week's news, as you will all know by now, uh, they have updated uh, areas that have been put into Tier 3 restrictions and this will affect metal detecting in the UK. For example, if you click on the link, it'll tell you uh, I've, I've put the government guidance on there. So you'll be able to see what the restrictions are. So there'll probably be no rallies in the areas that uh, may have been having them in the coming days. So, again, just click on the continue reading links and you will be able to follow that anyway. Next up, a French detectorist accused of looting on a vast scale after a haul discovered at his home. And you can see the amount of fantastic artifacts that he's got there. Patrice T suspected over hoard including 14,000 Roman coins he claimed to have dug up in a Belgian field. Uh, they are potentially saying that he actually either nighthawked the site or were they in fact found in France and he's... Uh, gone over to Belgium because it's illegal to detect in France. And if you can hear a dog barking, please excuse me, the arseholes next door who leave the dogging howling all day have obviously gone out. Did you know we have an app? Take a drink for all those in the know. Uh, We have a new Android app so you can get all the news straight to your phone. Just click on there or on the image to take you straight to the Android site to be able to download our app. And it's fine if I do say so myself. Metal detectorist Rob Jones from Copoyeth has won an award for the discovery of a Roman lead ingot, which is there. Uh, the detectorist from Copoyeth received the most significant find in Wales from Searcher magazine for his discovery of a Roman lead ingot near Rosset, which is one of the significant objects found in Wales in recent years. Uh, again, if you click on there, I'll tell you all about the ingot itself and the. Um, tell you what the de-inscription actually says. Ancient Egyptian hoard of counterfeit dirty money unearthed. A shortage of silver caused by the collapse of leading Bronze Age civilization around the eastern Mediterranean around 1200 BC resulted in the original dirty money. Several hundred years of coins had been, several hundred of years before coins had been invented. The ancient counterfeiting was revealed by archaeologist Zilla Eschel, uh, then a doctoral student of the University of Haifa, who studied the chemical composition of 35 buried hordes of Bronze Age silver found on archaeological sites around Israel. Uh, and also, if you click on the images here, these are the articles regarding metal detecting that we've published this week. Uh, cannonballs discovered near the Battle of Beachy Head. A school medal belonging to a Liverpool seaman found buried in Sussex after 100 years. A year of metal detecting finds in Newfoundland in Canada. Finding Captain William Jackson, also in Newfoundland in Canada. A poison ring head discovered in Norfolk. 
who invented the metal detector and how does it work? And they are all our latest articles. The only other one which is not on there is this one, which you may remember, but it's now all been sorted. Lovely little ring. Uh, Cy Weller, we had that as a guest a couple of weeks ago, was detecting in East Sussex with his father, Chris, with his Mindlob Equinox 800. You can watch the video of when he actually found the um, the ring, as you can see there, which was absolutely stunning. And he thought automatically that it was a Roman ring. Uh, but when he got it home, he found it was a little bit... Um, a little bit more modern. He took it to Chatfield Jewellers, local to himself for cleaning and identification, and they've had it returned, and you'll see it momentarily. And it's a beautiful 1907 nine-carat gold intaglio ring with a Birmingham hallmark. There you go. Absolutely stunning. So all of that information and much, much more. Even that one about sea monsters and that one about an Egyptian mystery. I forgot I'd actually done them, so I'll have to share them later. But they are all the current things going on on the archaeology and metal detecting magazine so without further ado can i welcome you to tonight's guest a good friend of mine uh, i won't say old friend because i said that before he went old mr mark ollie good evening mark good evening dave <laughs> i didn't say old no you didn't you didn't i'll give you that <laughs> <laughs> uh mark and i have now known each other for coming up to 20 years well, i know him too long isn't it yeah. isn't it wow i know you but some of the viewers might not know you so would you mind introducing yourselves to them right okay um archaeologist historian writer tv presenter uh musician i play the drums um that probably covers all of it i also produce programs as well um came out of Lost Treasures, which you've probably already seen the trailer for. Um, and I'm still producing them up to today, and I'm still working in television today. Uh, when you can do that under the current crisis, um, that's that's me. I can't really say any more than that. Uh, I'm just sat here at Christmas time with my Christmas stuff around me and doing the old Val Dunican thing, but, you know, without the, uh, without the Christmas jumper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Are you in a rocking chair? No, no, I'm not in a rocking chair. You can't have a rocking chair when you're on camera because you keep going back and two out of focus. But, <laughs> Believe yeah. me, some of the people we've had on weren't oh, even dear. in focus to begin with. Right, okay. But, hey. So <clears throat> yeah. how did you originally become involved in um, the, the subjects of history and archaeology? Um, interesting one, that. Um, if you turn the clock back to the 1960s and 70s, there the weren't professional archaeological diggers back then and uh, it wasn't really a profession it's something you did with the local antiquarian societies and, and, and what have you um, and Warrington Archaeological and Historical Society had volunteer diggers and my dad was a volunteer digger so in the mid to late 1970s they were excavating the Roman settlement here at Wilsfield Causeway in Warrington um, and I was eight years old and my dad said do you fancy coming on a dig so I went yes okay um, and literally handed me a trowel. He went, right, in that hole now, down in the hole, scraping away in the sand. I did what everybody does. Everybody does this on time team. As soon as I hit the first piece of Roman pottery, I picked it up and I went, oh, look what I've got here. And everybody went, put it back, put it back. So anyway, from, from that point on, I was absolutely hooked uh, at digging archaeology. For me, the chase is better than the catch. I do like seeking things out. But then kind of once you've found something, I mean, it must be common to metal detectors as well. You just want to move on because you're never quite sure what the next thing's going to be. So from eight years old onwards, I uh, was volunteer digger for many, many years and then uh, ended up going to art college, which at that time was opposite Warrington Museum. Um, trained under some really, really excellent people there from Liverpool um, on their extension studies course, then got swallowed up by the newly emerging archaeology so i ended up doing norton priory and some castles and all sorts of places uh, through the 1970s into the 1980s um, then in early 1980s i got a record contract with a, a a pop band and vanished from history <laughs> uh, for the next 21 years um but you know when you're out touring with bands and stuff like that you know your training comes into play and visited lots of excellent places i mean people, people get really bored on tour so, you know, when you're turning up in different towns, different cities, you get a chance to go and have a look at the archaeology, which is what I did. So then I came back to it in the 1990s. I retired from the music business, wrote the first book, Celtic Warrington, uh, first in the series, Celtic Warrington and Other Mysteries. And um, the rest, as they say, is history. 
sorry for the pun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we'll go on to something a little bit later on, uh, Mark, about when you get excited and pull something out of a hole. Oh, yeah. All right. We'll, 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 in fact, I've got a photograph to prove it. There's, there's, the, pho- there's the photograph. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> so, so, obviously, 1990s, you formed at some point in that time a Celtic Warrington Project, am I right? Yes, um, I suppose I should really explain what's going on. Uh, it's a good chance for me first plug as well. I've got a few of these coming up. There it is. That's Celtic Warrington Other Mysteries, book one. I've I wrote got exactly that. the same one in my hand at the moment. I would imagine you have. Okay, uh, I wrote that. So uh, that kind of got me sort of fired up back again into archaeology. Um, and it was followed by number two. There you go. Ooh, there we are, number two. So you can dash out and get that one from Amazon. And that was in turn followed up by, yes, you've guessed it, number three. That's the third one in the series. OK, this is the rarest one because I don't think everybody knew this was released. Uh, but there is a number three. There you go. Um, in order to work with things like that and generate things like that, it, it's quite handy to have your own archaeological unit. So actually, CWP, Celtic Warrington Project Archaeology, ran for 12 years which is not bad for an independent unit. Um, And we just did loads and loads of digs. Uh, We just had a habit of hitting the target. We trained a lot of people, generated innumerable uh, amounts of fines, reports, uh, mostly working on private sites for private people rather than commercial archaeology. Um, And at the end of the day, it started Lost Treasures. So... I can honestly say that had those books not been written, there would be no lost treasures uh, because they became the source material for the TV program, which again ran to uh, 22 episodes over five years, which is quite some going for, uh, you know, relatively small ITV production. Um, While I'm into collectibles, though, I may as well plug this one because if you can find that, there you go. There are only 500 of those ever made, and that's season one. And we're currently working on trying to get two and three out at the moment. There's one or two licensing issues. But if it comes out, it'll probably be on flash drive. But those you might be able to pick up second hand because they uh, they sold out like hotcakes. So uh, that's the complete Celtic Warrington, I guess. That's that's everything you need to know. And the programme Lost Treasures is very, very rare. In I think there's only one or two episodes that are actually on YouTube as well. Uh, yes, the reason the reason for that is ITV are quite keen on the productions they do. Although at the moment it's out of license and the copyrights devolve back to me, uh, we're currently working on trying to get something on one of the uh, probably the pay to view channels and trying to get them all online. Uh, they're not actually there yet, but you know, as they always say, watch this space. Um, the time will come. Um, Fing- fingers crossed, because you, yeah. you, the last time we actually spoke uh, on the podcast. Uh, you were nowhere near that position. No, no. Um, I have done, I have recently done a small bit of work for Iconic Media, which is um, David Icke's son's channel. Um, They do a walking programme for their subscribers, and I do 20 minutes or so for them down at Avebury. So if people want to go and Google that and try and find Iconic, uh, it's the first episode of a series, so I may appear in that again. Um, so that's kind of the direction I'm heading into the pay-to-view stuff. So maybe that's a hint as to where, you know, Lost Treasures may ultimately end up, mm. uh, plus a couple of other productions as well. It is worth me mentioning, when when we did Lost Treasures, there were two other DVDs that came out. There's that one, which you can see. If you want to see Europe's Roswell, it's UFO Crash with Debris, so there's evidence. I think that's on uh, Sky Channel 200, so you can actually go and watch that. Um, and there are a few of these knocking around, okay? So uh, you can always Google that. You'll find that. I'm getting these plugs in thick and fast. The other collector's <laughs> one is that one, Britain's Lost Mega Fortress, which we, we actually produced that for Sky. That's a Sky History Channel uh, DVD that was done in the middle of Lost Treasures. So that was a spin-off, if you like. But again, second-hand copies only, I'm afraid. There were 500 of those produced as well. Um, is that the there. one uh, regarding Chester? Or yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, specifically it's the Chester material. But there's a lot more in that than appeared in Lost Treasures. Obviously, you can't do a lot in, in a, a you know a half-an-hour show. That's about an hour and ten minutes, something like that, with lots of extras. Mm. 
Yeah, that's that's I've seen that on a quite a few times on the history channel. So yeah, and I'm sure other people will have as well. So obviously you you've I mean I, I I've been on what I think about four or five different um sites with you as an archaeologist. You you kindly accepted myself and some other people onto uh your site as volunteers at and I'm gonna get beaten up because I'm great when it comes to pronunciation. Flanarman in Yal. Yes. I yes. got it right, which is yes, between uh, right. Ruthin and Mould in North Wales. Yes, yeah, really um, significant North Wales site. Very, yeah. very significant. Uh, yeah. sad, sadly, it was me that sprung a leak as well, but we'll we'll come back to that momentarily because <laughs> it might have been a good thing. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, yeah, you find what you find, you deal with it as you get to yeah. it sort of thing, yeah. But you, you brought us onto the site originally. Uh, now, it was just Celtic Warrington Project people who were on there uh, at the time. And uh, you, you'd started, there was, there's a cave. Uh, now, Cave Babe was obviously excavated there, Jenny. Tell us about that cave in particular, because it turned out, again, to be quite significant. It's a happy story, but it's also got a sad ending. Um, we were excavating in a cave um, that was full of rubble, and it was pretty obvious that the floor level we were looking at wasn't the original floor level of the cave. So we started to drop part of the floor level very carefully to see what was going on. It was literally full of hardcore, like the stuff that you build roads on, you know, limestone, limestone chippings. Um, and then we noticed that there was a, a cavity going away into the wall of the cave. So uh, we were looking to have a speleologist, which, as you say, is Jenny. That's someone that specializes in excavating in small spaces. Um, and gradually this, this cavity began to open up. So all of a sudden she's in a cave that hasn't been opened since you know the backfill went into this main cave anyway she carried on excavating that that was exciting enough we had you know it was so small that she kind of squeezed in and we had to pass her a video camera so she could video inside it excuse me um and then she decided to keep going and there was another <laughs> cave at the back of that cave and then she decided to keep going again so she then came to a point where the rubble the infill literally vanished in front of her it went boom 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 and you could hear this rattling apparently in the distance where it rattled into this enormous cavity and she shone a torch in and you can see this on the video that we shot at the time she shone a torch in and you can't see where the torch beam goes it just goes into nothing but guess what it was on the last day so we had to fill it in so we blocked the hole up so we know there's this sucking great big cavity down there and we can't get in it. We can't do anything. So it's just sat there. And it's still sat there to this day. <laughs> I would be delighted to put some kind of fiber optic camera in there or some floodlights or something. Um, but that was like the biggest discovery of the, you know, we've been on there for years. I can't remember how many years, six, seven years or something. And that was the biggest discovery. And we couldn't do anything about it because we were literally pulling off the day she found it. So there well, you go. The cave itself uh excavated in there we found multiple bones of different varieties tell us about them because again there was quite a few shocks wasn't there yeah many surprises there uh we assume that the infill we assume that everything that was in there had obviously you know been dumped in there by quarry workers because it looked like quarry working stuff but the, the stuff that was coming out of the deposits all of it was extinct animal bones uh, we also did a pollen and um, sort of snail shell analysis of the stuff that came out of the back of the cave. And that was washed in at a time when it was more than likely in the Ice Age. We got a bone net making pin out of there. And again, right at the very end, the last week of digging, we got a tiny little human toe bone. Now, you've got to remember that there's no burials in this cave. Everything is just all you know mixed up. It's really confused. Uh, but that actually went off to Liverpool for analysis by a professor at the archaeological department there in Liverpool. And she confirmed, she sent us a full report, a full analysis of, of all the bones. The bones, the report, the analysis, all the information to do with the dig, um, then went to Clangothlan Museum. So it's in their archive now, uh, where you can get access if you book for access. Um, but there's some really interesting stuff in there. Absolutely brilliant, brilliant dig, brilliant site. Um, again, it's what you can do when you're working on a private site. Uh, you can work for the people that own the site and you can bring people on then who are selected for jobs on the site, very much like yourself. Mm, I absolutely loved it. I mean, you employed us, and I, I use the term employed as in used us, 
uh, myself and Steve uh, to to do a metal detecting survey on the site as well. Yeah. And again, yeah. you had multiple finds of consequence. Not only there, but again, I'll go back momentarily to the adjacent field at the back of the property as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, but if I remember correctly, I know for a fact the one that stands out is definitely Jetton's on there uh, that, that ended yeah. up in like Northland Museum. Yeah, or yeah. Library Museum. Uh, the big one, the big one, I suppose, was that in uh, the 1950s, there was a military aircraft that crashed outside Clenarmon, and it's quite a, a big local story. Um, mm. Nobody actually knew where it came down. There was just a big bang in the sky, and this, this aircraft you know, went whizzing down. There was a big flash. Nobody knew where it crashed. Doing the detecting in the field immediately behind the farm confirmed that that is at least where one of the engines and part of the fuselage came down. So, well, we definitely also find, if you remember, we had the um, communications board as well. Yes, you did. Yes, and you um, did. I, I mean, I, yeah. all I was finding was rivets and rivets and bits of aircraft. <laughs> it was, it, well, when, it, when back then, Mark, in like 2002, I didn't realise the significance being a metal detector is because mm. it was more or less at the start of my journey as an archaeologist. No, I'm not. Can I? You're as an a metal detectorist. detectorist. That's yeah, what you are. Yeah. An archaeo detectorist. So it's. It, it, I don't. Now it's more significant, and I'd love to be able to relive it now, as opposed to the, the little knowledge that I had back then. Well, you, you've got to start somewhere. You basically Indeed. got to start somewhere. I mean, what an amazing site. We had everything from Ice Age right the way through to a 1950s plane crash. We did. Um, you know, I mean amazing sites like that don't come along every day um it's now been identified as one of what's known as the cleese sites which is the uh, welsh court of the princes so the tommen which is the uh, the hill the norman motton bailey castle oh, that's oh, stuck no, adjacent, yeah, yeah that's look adjacent to the site we were on ours is older it's a dark age palace site basically that's uh, where we ended up at the end of the day that's how it appears because uh, we were getting uh, post-Roman finds, which is really unusual, mm. uh, especially off the roadway. And then you've got Garmin's well in the back. Well, Garmin was alive in the 5th and 6th century. So, hey, oh, I know I'm sticking my neck out there because it's not the official <laughs> I'm not that yeah. one. It's how you actually came about Garmin's well. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? That, yeah, that was, yeah. that was some, somebody. Some with a pickaxe. <laughs> no, it wasn't a pickaxe. It, it was, was a crowbar. Oh, a crowbar. If you remember, we had a perfectly formed uh, rectangular trough basically yeah, in the it was basically like a tank and i'm of... fiddling with a stone yeah. in the middle i yeah. pulled the stone out and by the time the next morning we came the yeah. whole site was flooded to the point of no return <laughs> yeah but i mean in all fairness it was a well so sooner or later that was probably inevitably going to happen um and, and the best part of it was once the water came up, you couldn't argue that it was anything else but a well. Absolutely, when it yeah. flooded, you just took one look at it, and it was obvious what it was. And that's and I when thought... I also received my second slap of the uh, pig as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah I it. banned crowbars, I banned <laughs> pickaxes. There was none of that going on. You know, I mean, the famous one, isn't it, Richard III, you know, live on television, that female archaeologist puts the pickaxe through his skull, you know. And I'm like, <laughs> now you know. Now you know why I banned them. Now you know why you shouldn't be using pickaxes on digs. And, and the so, other one... Uh, the front the front garden we'll call it was basically um that was where you were looking originally for the signs of the original manor house am i correct but yes. obviously things different occurred and, and this is also mark where i personally realized the benefits of having chickens as archaeologists <laughs> we yeah. had multiple chickens on the site that allowed free reign and when we went home the chickens went pecking everywhere at the soil that we'd obviously moved oh yeah and, uh, talk about archaeologists some of the oh, things yeah. that they were finding was spectacular well well they tend to throw stuff out of the way don't they if anyone yeah. gets on the road they just chuck it out of the way that front field was amazing because here we are looking for a you know what is essentially a at least site you know a, a sort of a, a manor house or whatever and what we got instead appears to be the metalworking floor so you guys are detecting it and what you basically got was an outward scatter of, of metal fragments going away from where the anvil would have been and stuff like that. So it's great. We could actually plot it without needing expensive gear. We just set you guys loose on it. Um, and then there was the wall across the middle, and it looked as if it was attacked in the Civil War because there was definitely evidence of conflict um, on the outside of the wall. So the wall looked like it had been added as a defensive structure across the front. It wasn't quite what we were looking for, but it was still exciting and it was totally mm. unexpected. And then coming into the backfield uh, is where we started our personal little 
Yeah. Gig. And uh, this is where I got told off for the first time because everyone went off for dinner. Uh, <laughs> and um, apart from me, and I stayed over the hole, and I decided to start taking stones out, didn't I? That, yeah. That, that hadn't been um, long recorded. recorded. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I got told off very much so. And it was, uh, again, during the end of the day. The night dew came down. We all went home while we was there. We come back the next morning. And uh, it occurred that I'd actually found something else inadvertently. <laughs> yeah. And that's where the Roman road popped up. Yeah, that was the Roman road. It actually was the Roman road surface. Uh, it was a great find. I mean, obviously, you didn't do a great deal of damage because you can see on that photo, there's only a tiny slot about a foot wide by about two foot mm. across where you, you took a few stones out. But uh, when you're dealing with Welsh sites, all they are, as a rule, is piles of rocks. So you've really got to pay attention to the piles of rocks. It's kind of the other side of archaeology. But it does raise this issue with metal detectors that, you know, whatever you hit, whatever you find, wherever it is, you know, for goodness sake, keep some kind of a record. Film it, photograph it, video it, GPS where you are. You know, um, if it's in a public place where there's heavy traffic, then obviously you might have to do some form of rescue to rescue it if you think it's going to get nicked or damaged or trampled. But at the end of the day, the whole thing is about recording. It's about, you know, where it is, what it is and how it is, um, because that's what you're going to pass on to future generations. You know, there's no point sort of waving around some of the best archaeology in the world and then not having a clue where it comes from. Uh, you know, when you're dead and gone, the thing that survives are the, re the records, the recording of that. Uh, which CWP did really well. We've 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 got a huge archive, uh, which eventually I think will probably find its way into into Trafford. It'll go into the archaeological community in Manchester, I think, eventually. Um, but wow, you know, it's still active. You know, we're still adding to it. There's still finds coming up today. So, is Celtic Warrington Project still active? Um, it's not active in the sense that we're digging. Okay, we're we're. We're not. We're just too too old for it, really. Uh, you know, uh, we're all mostly non-diggers now. Um, but you, it's, when you get into archaeology, you cannot escape finds. Okay, so the people who are watching this are probably thinking, "I wonder what the last thing was he found." You know, what was the last thing he unearthed? Well, I'm going to amaze you now by saying I'm actually sat next to it because directly adjacent to me here, this here, is a chimney with an open fire underneath it of um, about. 100 years old um, and when we were restoring the property we didn't even know that was there so earlier this year we actually set about pulling it out clearing it out restoring it and about a month ago we actually refired it but that is industrial archaeology um, it's of a particular type of fireplace that's common to this village mm. there are actually about half a dozen of them scattered around so even in the process of restoring the property that I'm sat in now, archaeology played a key part in it. Um, and, but there, obviously there's, there's lots of more exciting finds than a, a fireplace. Uh, but it, that's the last find. So literally I'm sat in now talking to you with a find next to me. <laughs> so of all the finds that you, you have, and I'm talking artefacts as opposed to um, buildings and brick walls and structures and such like, as an artefact, what would be the most memorable find that you've been privy to or found yourself? Right. Um, it's an interesting one, OK? I've got to say right at the beginning that I'm, I'm probably most famous for being the archaeologist that's never found anything materially valuable. Because um, everybody asks me, oh, have you found anything made of gold or silver or, you know, precious stones? The answer's probably no. I don't think I've ever found anything of that sort of level of value. I did once archaeologically excavate a knight in armour that was, was still in his burial. I mean, that's exciting, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've found an entire Saxon hill fort before now, but I've not actually, you know, materially benefited from that. However, I am quite well known for finding that, which is, as it stands at the moment, the oldest man-made object in Cheshire. And that was picked off a field in Mere, which is not far from Nutsford. Um, and I was out on a, one of the Celtic Warrington surveys looking at a building with a photographer friend of mine. And she actually picked this up and she handed it to me. And I'm like, wow, that, that is quite a discovery. We then went on to find another seven pieces of flint within about two metres of this thing. And the significance of it, uh, which will be lost on most people looking at it, because it just looks like an enormous blob of toffee, uh, the significance is that it's Ice Age 
and it dates from about 480,000 BC. And at this time, when this, this was around, it was Homo erectus that made it. There was woolly mammoths, there was woolly rhinoceros, saber-toothed cats, so you're back in prehistory. But even more importantly, we here in the north of England were supposed to be under about two miles of ice because this is the ice age. But very clearly, this is a hunter site. It's a hunting site because this is for chopping up meat. Mm. Uh, it's from a, a gap in the glaciers called the Hoxton Interglacial. So by picking this off a field and collecting the rest of the flint, um, me and my Celtic Warrington photographer rewrote the entire Ice Age history of Britain by picking up this stone. So, you know, uh, they talk in metal detecting terms of eyes only finds. Well, keep your eyes open, guys, because believe me, some of these eyes only finds, you know, are quite significant. So that's probably one uh, that is, you know, up there with the best Absolutely. of the best. It doesn't yeah, really monetary go. value means nothing at the end of the day. I mean, some no. of my metal no. detecting finds, you know, just a, a pair of Victorian nutcrackers that I found means something to me because I found them and I thought, wow, last time somebody was working with these was 100 odd years ago. Yeah. And I found them and I, I didn't know what they were when it came out the ground, but I love them, absolutely love them. And I'm sure other people will be, you know, not dissimilar in the finds. But when you say about eyes only finds, many of the people, that, well, several, 10, maybe 15 people that I know have found something not dissimilar, some form of uh, mm. worked tool, Neolithic, Paleolithic and such yeah. like. Yeah. We should keep our eyes out, not just obviously for this, but, you know, when you're out in the uh, the ploughed fields where everything's been turned over, some fantastic things that oh, you yeah. see, especially in areas that are well known for um, – you know, stone circles and such like Arbolo, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Bull Ring, like Glastonbury Tor, or Glastonbury Tor, I'm going to talk about Stonehenge, all them <laughs> different places, places within a radius. Keep your eyes out. I mean, yeah, yeah. personally, Mark, every time I'm out and about, if I'm metal detecting, I find a piece of pottery, it goes in my bag. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Whatever it is. <laughs> totally. As long as you know where it comes from, you know, you might get a scatter. It, it might identify a site. Absolutely. Um, I've got I've another one. I've them finds as well. Yeah, do you want me to share another one? Of course I do, yeah. Uh, CWP Archaeology excavating uh, a farmhouse here in Appleton, which is just up the road from I was here. with you. Uh, Pulling you out were with me. Pulling out do shoes. You, yeah, do you remember when we were excavating what appeared to be some kind of arranged back garden? Um, very late on an October day, there was uh, the sun coming in at quite an oblique angle, and uh, there was a big block of stone that appeared to have a handprint in it. And I've actually got the cast of that here. Here it is. I um, don't know how clear you can see that, but you can see, yeah, see it. There yeah, it is. Yeah. You can quite clearly see there what appears to be, actually I'm doing it wrong there, what appears to be a, yeah, there it is. There's a handprint there. Okay. You can quite clearly see that. Um, turns out it's a dinosaur footprint. Okay. Wow. Now, around here, we have this thing um, called the labyrinthodon or chirotherium, if you want to be technical. And it's supposed to be a crocodile, supposed to walk on all fours. But I actually took this to Liverpool Museum because I don't know a great deal about, you know, dinosaur footprints. You can quite clearly see here, it's, it's got a sort of a V shape to the middle pad. You see that V shape there? See that V shape? Yeah. yeah. Now, the chirotherium prints are supposed to have the pads going across ways that way. Now, chirotherium are ten a penny, actually. There's quite a lot of them around. They find them in limb. They find them on the Wirral. This one looks more like it's a two-footed dinosaur that runs on two feet. So there's every possibility that the original of this, which is back with the original site and the, the original uh, owners, uh, the original of this could be from a two-footed dinosaur, very much like a velociraptor. So you're looking here at, at, at a runner, not a walker. Mm -hmm. So that's another really important, significant find um, in, in a block of sandstone in somebody's back garden. I wasn't actually there for that, but an interesting story about that particular site. Janet and Celia are with me, Janet, better known as Dobby, uh, had to pull me out of the pit because it was getting a bit deep and I'd actually turned purple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Anyway, Mark, yeah. uh, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to share the screen uh, okay. because we're going over to our uh, weekly draw. Uh, that'll be with us in... in 
about a minute. We can still chat to Len, obviously. I can't okay. see anything. You'll, you'll be able to see what's going on, but we can't. <laughs> I can't see anything else because I'm looking at this. But, uh, yeah, Appleton Thorne, it was uh, an interesting sight. I mean, obviously, you've took the history of that right back to prehistory again. Well, yeah. Why, were we, why was I, in particular, that's what I'm memorable about it, bringing out old shoes? Ah, that's because there was an admiral called Admiral Daniel Hoare, H-O-A-R-E, who in 1752-53 rebuilt the entire house. And what we wanted to do was find his bottle dump in effect. Um, and we got a hot tip that, you know, there was this dump not far from the back door of the original part of the property. So we just put everybody on it straight away. Now, it wasn't the Admiral's dump. It was the farm dump and it started around 1800 and then came more up to date. But there were just so many finds behind the wall and the wall needed rebuilding. So one way or another, all that stuff was going to, you know, come out. So the, the owners of the property said, right, knock yourselves out, you know, get stuck in. Uh, fantastic training opportunity. Uh, bottle dumping has come to an end, essentially. Now, there's not many people that still do it. So to be able to officially do it and record it layer by layer was uh, was just a privilege. And then the old guy who, who owns the farm came walking up near. He, he was rummaging through the finds and he went, oh, where do you find these? And he pulled a pair of glasses out like that. He said, I dropped them behind the wall when I rebuilt it in the 1960s. He said, thank you very much. And he cleaned <laughs> the lenses on the glasses, put them back on and walked off. He was <laughs> pretty chuffed a bit. <laughs> right. Uh, the draw is just starting to take place, Mark. Uh, you have to pick a number between like, how many we got this week. Uh, 1 and 22. Now, there's only 22 because I forgot to put it up, so it's a little bit uh, late. So pick a number between 1 and 22. Right, totally random, number 17. I'll go for my normal... No, in fact, I'm going to go for number four. So, first number zero, second number zero, so it might be a four. This is going to look like a fex again if it's number four. And it's number seven. I was going to go for seven. So, can you read that at all, Mark? No. (laughs) Right, so the winner this week for the 10 Diggers Dips tokens is... Mc Shocko, not hundred ah. percent sure who that is, but okay. congratulations and thank you to Diggers Dips for providing that. Now, Mark, oh. it's uh, time for people to go for a wee as Luke plays the adverts. Okay.
And you're watching XP Team USA. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we will be having the second draw in the near future. Luke's going to tap me on the shoulder when that is about to take place. And I forgot to mention at the start of the show, so you've got uh, several minutes to go over to ArcMD Mag TV on YouTube, and there's a small 30-second video. I just comment uh, subscribe, well, subscribe, and comment subscribe or Detecticon for your chance to win two full weekend tickets and with camping for Detecticon in July next year. Take no notice of the dates that I've put on there because they're wrong. But hey, there's still Detecticon tickets. Anyway, welcome back, young man. Welcome back. Yes, I'm here. So, uh, I, I, do you know, the, the conversation that we're having, Mark, it's spurred on so many memories of my own for the places that we've been to and uh, the things that I've seen and have been privy to. Going back to Slenarman and Yal, which I pronounced correctly, yeah. which had a yeah. fantastic uh, little pub called The Raven, which uh, oh, had fantastic yeah. real ale, uh, and a lovely church as well, uh, as well as the Mott and Bailey Castle and the Ice Age Cave and the Manor House. Yeah. And who just thought that for such a small village as well? well but, it, it, it was amazing, and the, and the locals was. really welcomed us. Um, oh, they did indeed. As a village, though, it's changed. I have to say that the the pub's gone. The Raven's not there anymore. Really? Yeah, it's a private house now. Um, I mean, obviously, the history's still there. I would encourage people to go and visit it. Uh, it is quite a significant place to go. Um, I would discourage people, though, um, from metal detecting a lot of the private land around there because they're quite keen. Uh, but if you just want to go and have a look at above-ground remains, there's, there's more than enough there for a, an enormous day out. 
Um, we did it as I think it was episode two of season one of Lost Treasures. So if anyone out there can find that blue box of the first six episodes, um, all the secrets are in there. Um, you have to just go and find a second-hand copy, I'm afraid. But yeah, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And it's the people, it's the people that make it, you know, which is probably the same, I would imagine, with metal detecting. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, as yeah. I say, myself and yourself have said, come on, Mark, let's go up the top. And we actually climbed the uh, the hill that the cave was within. And we stood on the top. And am I right in saying we also saw in the adjacent field, which was not on the same property, numerous circular shapes on the field? Yes, you were right. Yeah. What we ended up with was a line. There was a line of burial mounds um, and they were quite significant, the way they were spaced and the way they were positioned. Um, and we've actually got a complete line now all the way across the village. Uh, the church sits on one, um, all sorts. I mean, uh, th there's even more than I'm allowed to tell publicly, but there's a lot, a tremendous amount. Somebody could spend their entire life, I think, focusing on just on Clenarmon with the archaeology that's there. Absolutely mm -hmm. phenomenal, really phenomenal. So of all the sites that you've visited, you've been involved in, you've, you've dug on, which one would you think is is the most it was your favorite not the most significant was your favorite wow um it's got to be the one uh, you know 14 years of age you know i got dumped onto norton priory which was the biggest ever monastic archaeological dig in european history there's never been a bigger one uh, funnily enough, it's stuck at Runcorn. You know, it's the last place on God's earth you'd look for a, a medieval <laughs> priory, really, you know. Absolutely. Um, but it's just an incredible sight. And I, I can still remember to this day, there I am with this this brush, brushing away on this this skeleton's rib cage, no protective gear or anything, because you didn't bother in the 1970s. Uh, and I'm brushing away at the rib cage, and then the whistle blows, you know, you dust your hands off, and you pick your butty up, and you start eating your butty. You know, I mean, everyone out there now is cringing like mad, you know. Um, but as I looked up and I looked across the site, there's a, 120 to 130 skeletons all excavated. And most of that's done by volunteers. Yeah. But to just gaze across an entire monastic site under excavation, uh, it, what can I say? It kind of stays with you. Do you know what I mean? That's not something you're going to forget in a hurry. Um, is there any truth, Mark? Sorry. I, I was going to say, there is another one as well, and, and that stays with me as well. Um, people might remember that in the um, museum, the Maritime Museum in Liverpool, they actually had a U-boat, U-534, that was raised yeah. intact, and it was stuck on a big stand outside there. Well, just before they sliced that up to put it on the terminal where it is now, it's on the ferry terminal, um, in Lost Treasures, I got to go through that with a torch. So... <laughs> Dropping into one end of a U-boat and walking the full length of a U-boat with a torch, um, that kind of stays with your memory as well. You know, that's instead of me digging the archaeology up, the archaeology actually swallowed me. Yeah. You know, um, it was I like remember, I remember seeing that. At, uh, it was at Birkenhead oh, Docks for a while, wasn't it? Yeah, it's in one of the Lost Treasures episodes, and it is literally like walking through the Titanic with the water taken mm. out. So I'm not going to forget that one in a hurry. <laughs> Going back to uh, Norton Priory, there's a suggestion that one of the skeletons there was abnormally large. Is there any truth in that? Um, it depends what you mean by abnormally large. A giant. Um, well, there's a misnomer that knights and medieval people in general were midgets, and that's why all the doors are so small. Uh, I've excavated actually a lot of knights on different sites, at least three or four different sites. The average height for the average knight, is between six and seven foot. But there was one skeleton that was guessed to be, estimated to be over seven foot. Uh, so there was a really big fella, an absolutely really big fella. I seem to remember it, it was in the Dudutton Chapel, which I think was off to one side. So it's probably one of the Duduttons. But yeah. he, he was he was a big fella. He really was a big fella, you know, um, not to be tangled with. But it depends what you mean as a giant. I mean, if the rest of the population's growth was slightly stunted, yeah. anybody over seven foot is going to be significantly bigger. Um, and, and of course, it, not very far away, uh, just over the water, you also have the giant of hail. Ah, well, the giant of hail is a different story altogether. Uh, we featured him in Lost Treasures as well. And uh, I don't know if anyone ever saw the wood carving that was there. I mean, he really was big. I think you were talking in excess of nine foot. He was somewhat like nine foot ten. Uh, but he had um, hormonal growth problems. Uh, but he truly would have qualified as a giant 
Um, and fought in the uh, the King's Court as well. Yes, he did. He went down to London and had a boxing match with the King's champion and absolutely slaughtered him. Uh, this guy's hands were bigger than shovels, you know what I mean? So <laughs> you can imagine him just kind of getting into the ring and going, speak to the hand, speak to the hand. You know, the other guy wouldn't have stood a chance. Absolutely wouldn't have stood a chance. I, I actually, I was going through some old files the other day and found a number of old uh, articles that were written for me from a, a previous magazine, which I'm able to bring to the Archaeology and Metal Detective magazine, hence the one I've just released today, uh, the Sea Serpent uh, ones by Richard Freeman. Uh, but um, one of the things I actually found was something I wrote uh, a good 10 years ago about the giant of hail, so I'm able to put that mm. on this week. And the wood carving that you were on about, I've actually got an image of that, which is also going to be included. So, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic, yeah. It's, it's a fantastic tale. Uh, now, one of the other sites, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring this site up in particular because um, of the Metal Detecting Association, which you'll know where I'm going already, but we'll get to the Metal Detecting Association in, in a wee while. Uh, a place in um, Cheshire called Manly and Manly Old Hall, Am I right? Yes. You were looking yes. for the site of the old hall. Yeah. Uh, amazing site. Uh, moated platform identified from the air on Google and, um, you know, maps and what have you. It was actually on Victoria maps as a moat, but nobody really could understand what the site was made of, how it was composed, where the buildings were, where the bridge was. Um, so we kind of got stuck in over a number of seasons. We were on there quite quite a number of years. Um, and during that time period, we identified the entire layout of the site. But I know exactly what you're referring to because it's back to the same old story of, you know, I don't seem to find anything on dig sites. There's a <laughs> bloke walking past in the next field with a metal detector, thinks he's picked up some nuts and bolts at the bottom of this telegraph pole. So he goes digging and pulls out the manly ring, which, uh, you know, it's got a black raw diamond in the top of it, solid gold, absolutely phenomenal mount. The whole ring's carved. It's got writing on it. It's got religious symbols on it. Um, you know, it's got E3 stars, E3 stars, E, so it looks like it might have something to do with Edward III. You know, it's clearly medieval. It's clearly ecclesiastical. It could very well be Knights Templar, you know, um, and he, he picks this thing up, fights its way through the coroner process to get it, you know, finally to auction. Uh, 84,000 quid split equally between him and the landowner. But he did it properly. He did it right. He did it, you know, he reported yeah. it. It went through the right process. Um, and all I did was have it placed into my hand the Sunday morning after the Saturday <laughs> that he'd found it. And it's one of those moments where you look at it and you just break sweat. You know, it's it's just an incredible object. Yeah. Uh, and it was so good to have that and see that and be a part of it. I wrote the initial report on it. I translated the original um, engraved inscriptions on it um, and it wasn't far off where it ended up when it ran through the corridor. Mm. So it, that was a sort of personal victory for me, but it was absolutely phenomenal to actually see that. Uh, and literally it was about hundred yards away from, from where we were digging and all we're what? getting, is, you know, rotting shoes and old pieces of timber <laughs> and pottery. One of our re uh, viewers this evening, David Dickinson actually uh, preempted the conversation and, and yeah. came up with the ring. Uh, yeah. Something somebody else actually said before, Mark, which I meant to tell you, I was looking through the comments uh, during the break. Uh, I think it was Rob Random, perhaps. Uh, he's actually found the European Roswell. It's actually playing on Amazon Prime at the moment. Whoa, like it. So yeah. you can get Amazon Prime if you've got it, like myself. You'll be able to watch that. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it's it's still... Again, easily accessible is the uh, the Roman one regarding the the mega fortress as well. You'd have thought sure that plays semi regularly that somewhere. Yeah, I think the History Channel would have put that somewhere. Let me plug something other people can get hold of. By the way, um, here we go. Latest books. I bet you don't even know half of these are out there. But here we go. Latest books. Disappearing Ninth Legion. I've saw you advertise it. Yeah, that's out there. So go and have a look. That's on Amazon and, and Waterstones, etc. You got this one's a nice one. This here we go. Life and Times of the Real Robin Hood. Now yeah. the thing with this is we spelt Robin Hood the right way, but when you Google it, you've got to spell it the right way as well, okay? Because R O B Y N H O O D E. You know you've, you've got to get it right or you won't be able to find it. Yes, you've got it. I was just going to hold that one up, Green Man. Uh, he, Luke's way ahead of us. He's on the Amazon. Uh, he's, account, he's a good man. Mark Holly Amazon. He's going through the books on there. Hey, he's got them. He's got them. <laughs> well, I've actually, uh, I came to one of your Robin Hood lectures at uh, 
Buxton Spiritual Fair. You yeah. were doing a lecture there hey, on that, so I was actually privy to that. Uh, he's doing so well. You see, I know you, Mark. I can hold a conversation because I remember. Yeah, <laughs> so you were there. Get these spurs of information that are popping up in my head. Yeah, Don't you were there. Out Look at this one, an audio book, no, nothing UFO to do with... Chronicles. Oh, it might be something to do with me, I don't know. But no, it kind of ends at Celtic Warrington. If you flick back, though, I've got a couple of exclusives for you. OK, because there's one or two little bobs that are not on there. OK, that's the one he's just shown you, revealing yeah. the green man. Well, the Robin Hood one has now been converted into this. So oh, Life right. and Times the real Robin Hood. This is the DVD. So the book will tell you what, and the DVD will show you where. So we actually take you around all the sites. And that, again, it's a really good presentation. That It's one we've done ourselves. So it's not for television. You won't find it on television, but it is out there and you can order it. We've got plenty of these. OK, so do go and hunt that one down. And then just I thought I'd slip this one in. OK, this year, um, there's a really obscure order of knights, a bit like the Knights Templar that nobody will have ever heard of called the Fleur de Lis. But they're very, very old and they're a real order of knights and they are now... 580 years old. Wow. So if you want to get hold of a copy of this, just Google um, the Order of the Fleur de Lee, and you can be able to get one of these, which tells you all about one of the oldest knight orders in Europe. Okay. Uh, it's quite a phenomenal documentary of their celebrations of 580 years. The next one to come out is the Ninth Legion, which we've got, but we haven't had it pressed up yet. So, you know, watch this space. It's coming. Fantastic. Uh, last plug. Let me get the last plug. Somebody on there said, did I ever do acid when I was in the rock business? And the answer is <laughs> no. I've never done a drug in my life, but it did remind me to plug this. If you go on a site oh, called yes. Ex Exit Live, okay, uh, we got the old band back together after 40 years. Um, and this is the gig. And if you go on Exit Live and you, you search for Wolf, you can actually buy the best of the gig for a measly 4.99 so get yourselves out there and have a laugh and what it, musical really genre good. is that mark uh, it's it's rock music it, it's your typical you know well what it was 1970s rock music we played the gig in 1979 so we decided to come back and do it in 2019 at uh, the same venue with the same crew with the same audience with the same lineup playing exactly the same material Fantastic. um voila i don't think anybody else has ever pulled that off but there you go um <laughs> That's all the adverts, by the way. The adverts are out of the way now. Well, one of the uh, Rob Randoms asked, how can you be a musician without drugs? <laughs> uh, maybe I'm the first one. I don't high know. High on life, yeah. high on life. So, well, Connor, is, Hadley, at, least, at, least at least I'm still here playing. Do you know absolutely. what I mean? I'm, I'm 60 in two years. You yeah, know, but so, so, is, uh, so is Keith I Richards. Still, <laughs> I can still run upstairs, you know what I mean? Yeah, there's always Keith Richards, but then, you know, Rolling <laughs> Stones, they, they steal everybody else's soul, you know, that's how they well, say The thing is, when, when the world dies and the apocalypse yeah. happens, Keith Richards will still be there. Oh, absolutely. There'll be rats, cockroaches and Keith Richards. <laughs> and me, because I'm going to switch the lights off. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, back to Manly anyway, I was lucky enough to get hold of uh, Jenny's copy of the final report, the documents, and, and read oh, wow. through that at length. And that was fascinating, and, you know, the, the amount of things. Because, again, that was a big, long few years that you had on there. And, obviously, what I was going to bring up was that you ended up uh, actually as an instructor for Chester College University. Yes, yes. Um, I've done quite a lot of work with um, Chester College. I uh, taught archaeology there for quite a while. Uh, actually, it's a good advert, this as well, because I also ended up working for the archaeological department of, of Chester University. Um, I finished up doing a big uh, a big unit on um, reenactment and uh, public engagement, which is what I'm into, because I really believe that archaeology and history should be, you know, really communicated. You know, it's really important. And uh, the current people in power don't seem to agree with me, but, hey, you know, we'll let that one go. Um, anyway, even under the COVID uh, restrictions i have still been allowed to run a course for wilmslow guild that meets at the guild headquarters in wilmslow um i'm privileged to be there because they've been there for over 90 years they are the oldest adult facility in britain there's nobody been there longer than that so that's kind of where i've found as a home now um, i just completed a 10-week course for them uh, it's it's you know live basically i'm there in front of them however many students join on uh, we do it all as PowerPoints, so they're getting exclusive material that nobody else gets. Uh, and I'm running it again next year from September. 
So if people want to come and meet me and talk to me and see those talks, even if we're under lockdown, because it's an educational facility, it's allowed to stay open. So what, what, is that, what is that course exactly, Mark? It's Wilmslow Guild, and it's called The Archaeology of Myth, and it's going to be part two. But don't worry, you don't have to have done part one to uh, be able to appreciate it. And it, it just covers so much material, absolutely phenomenal amount of material. Um, and it's good fun. Well, any obviously advertising and um, information sent out to the general public you may need, you know where I am, you know what the, the magazine oh, does. Yeah, yeah. We'll obviously put it through there. Uh, would, I've got yeah. to say something. Pomsey Metal Detecting has just said, did you say bagpipes and rock in one sentence? He's talking to somebody <laughs> else. Have you no. never heard of Corn or ACDC, young man? Yeah, come on. <laughs> I mean, there was a band knocking around when I was doing uh, gigs and stuff in the 80s called Uslosh, and they were they were very much into pipes. I think they were using Irish pipes, um, and they were a proper serious rock band. Um, so, yeah. He's never heard of the, he's obviously never heard of the bad piper either. <laughs> no, no. With the no, fire no. coming out of the end, playing all Absolutely. heavy metal Absolutely. tracks on the bagpipe. Marvellous. <laughs> YouTube it later. Yes. <laughs> oh, you can YouTube Will you can look for Wilbzo Guild as well. They've got a, a site out there somewhere as well. You can look for the guild and um, do a bit of research. So, so. the last year, pandemic yeah. wise, it's yeah. it's been heinous for each and every one of us. How have you coped and what have you been doing during that period of time? Wow. OK. Um, what have I been doing during COVID? Um, I tried to complete as many unfinished projects as I possibly could. So I'm going to chuck a bit of an appeal out here. OK. I produced a book called Crystal Skulls and Human Heads, and it's archaeo science looking at the issue of the different ways we've perceived the human head through history. Um, and folks who are watching this might have noticed that sat over my shoulder on this side, just there in the bottom corner of the screen, I don't know if you can see him, is in fact a crystal skull. Um, he's probably pre-Columbian, he's over 500 years old, and he got me started on this. And I'm looking for a publisher, because my regular publisher, you know, doesn't quite agree with the content. So, hey, you know... Trust me, to, I'll put you on to Greenlight you know, Publishing tomorrow. I'll put you on to Julian Evanhart, and you can talk to Julian. They're releasing books many, many... It just... I'm a bit of pop... Where are you? Luke? Well, that's Put only one. Where's the book? Right? That's only yeah. one. I've finished that one. Here's their latest oh, book. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love it. Absolutely stunning, Mark. Right, it's, well, listen... It's the best book I've ever seen. Right, while I've, I've got you... One. While I've got you, I have yeah. got... For that format, right, that is the format I want, the size, the pictures, the illustrations. I have got a book on the entire history of King Arthur, Merlin, and Joseph of Arimathea that's took 43 years to finish, and I finished it this year. And that's the format I want for it. It's totally exclusive. John Matthews, who, who's the world, um, world's best Arthurian scholar, he's written the introduction for it. It's got massively rave reviews, but apparently it's too large for my publisher because they only do the tiny books that you, mm. you can see that I've shown up to now. I would be delighted to talk to them about the King Arthur one as well. That's two projects I've finished. Well, I'll introduce also... you tomorrow, tomorrow morning when I've had to do what I've got to do, which I don't want to do, but I've got to do. <sighs> I hey, will... We're linking, uh... we're linking people up live on air here. This is brilliant. <laughs> hey, this is if I can, it's one of the things I try to do. If I can help somebody and put them in communication with somebody else, I know can help them. I'm more than happy to. Julian well, Evanhart, uh, he yeah. works for Treasure Hunting Magazine, and they're, they're also owned Greenlight Publishing. Now... Is there, you know, so there's a book catalogue, for instance, with all the different things that they've done. Uh, and, you know, the books are second to none. I've, I've not seen books quality wise yeah. as good as these. And uh, obviously, if, I, if I stick it in communication with Julian, and then you can obviously yeah, yeah. work between yourselves and see where you get. But uh, well, well, there's a few people that have seen the Arthur manuscript up to now, and it is only a few people. They've, they've all absolutely gone bonkers, they've raved about it. Um, because it, it's just full of stuff, uh, really relevant stuff, you know. Um, so, yeah, if you can link us up. The other thing I finished as well is I finally finished The Ninth Legion um, as a DVD. And it's, in my opinion, it's the best one I've ever done. But at the moment, it only exists on flash drive because obviously we can't manufacture it till we're out of this current yeah, yeah. pandemic. But, uh, you know, watch this space. So the book that I've got, which is The Ninth Legion, is now also going to be available like the Robin Hood one 
as a DVD. So that's that's three things I've done, as well as working with the rock band. You know, it's it's not been uh, it's not been a dull few months. Oh, and I've done an entire house up as well, and dug this fireplace out in the process. So. <laughs> I'll put your Christmas tree up. Oh yeah, managed to get the Christmas tree up as well. Everything else is in boxes. <laughs> Luke, Luke, Luke texts me during the show. That's how Luke and I communicate. I mean, okay. so if you see me looking down, it's because people, as well as questions on there, a lot of people generally send questions via my mobile phone as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, Luke's yeah. asked me to ask you, what do you think of the Curse of Oak Island series? Um, I followed it probably for the first two thirds of the episodes. Um, I've studied the Oak Island mystery and I looked at the way they were approaching things, which, to be honest, was a bit brutal. And then it kind of got better. Um, I never saw the end of it. But the frustrating thing was they didn't seem to find what they were looking for. Now, somebody's going to correct me now and tell me probably in the last episode that they found the treasure of Oak Island. But that didn't seem to be where that was going. But the, the episodes I saw, I did enjoy the bits where they were finding things. Um, I don't have any problem with the medieval stuff they found because I'm not um, I'm not against, you know, things in America before Columbus. Quite the opposite. I'm actually massively in favour of that. If people want to, there was a book produced in the 1970s by an author called Barry Fell, and it was called America BC. And the Americans liked it so much that they banned it. Um, and if you have a look at that book, if you can go find it secondhand somewhere, that really does tell you that America has got tons of history going all the way back to prehistory. Uh, mm -hmm. The Irish were there, the Vikings were there, the Egyptians dropped in, there's Roman shipwrecks, there's medieval shipwrecks, there's all sorts of stuff around America. Uh, just because everybody wants to, you know, pin it on Columbus doesn't mean that it's not there. So, yeah, Oak Island, yeah, I, I think they opened the lid on a lot of things as well during the series, which was good. Uh, my kind of series, but, you know, I'd have moved it a bit faster than it, it was going. Um, if you ever watch Lost Treasures, you know, if, if you... You can't nip out for a pee break in the adverts because, you know, you've kind of got to process what's gone on in the first half and the second half moves just as fast. Um, and that's my idea of television. I don't look about, you know, um, but uh, yeah, enjoyed it. Enjoyed mm. it. Well, uh, when you talk about Lost Treasures, it's definitely episode one of season one about Winnick available yes. on YouTube. And what I'll do tomorrow, Mark, for the, the people who want to watch it, save going searching. I'll put that in a post uh, on the Archaeology Metal Detecting magazine and put that out for people to watch at their own leisure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So at least there's one that they can see. Yeah, we've uh, remastered. We've remastered season two. Yeah. And we've remastered season three, so they're both available. And they were both filmed in HD, but the first series was filmed in ordinary definition in ordinary format, which has been the the sticking point for trying to get this thing out there because all three seasons are in three different formats because yeah. technology was moving on. Um, the second and third series people probably haven't seen. We got that. And as I said at the beginning, we're negotiating to try and put out there, but there's very little of it anywhere out there on, on, on the internet. Um, Professor Stephen Harding, who does the Vikings for the Wirral, he managed to get all the Viking bits out of the series posted on Wirral Borough Council's site. So if you put in Stephen Harding and you look for the Viking bits, um, I'm only in a few of them. I'm not in all of them. Uh, Stephen tended to take charge of those bits. Uh, they're out there as well. But there's, there's, there's loads of extras. There's loads of um, extra bits floating around the internet from back then. Hmm. One thing uh, somebody else wants to ask, Mark, is what is your thoughts in relation to metal detectorists and their benefits to the archaeological community? Um, OK, I'll start at the beginning, you know, uh, 1970, whatever it was, 74, 75. Uh, my dad bought me uh, what was laughingly called a metal detector back then, uh, which was a butty box with a battery in it. And it kind of went, ooh, and that was it. Um, and all I found was a load of rusty chains and bits of rusty nonsense. So I never really went back to metal detecting. Um, and then through my archaeology, obviously, the whole of, of metal detecting developed at the same rate that my archaeology was developing. Um, then we got things like the time team where they were, you know, doing really stupid things like scattering washers on site so the detectors couldn't go on there. And they had this big like hoo-ha, do we like them, don't we like them, this, that and the other. Through the entire of my uh, archaeological career, I've always been an enormous fan of technology. I love technology. And I can confidently say, as indeed you've already said, that a majority of what we've discovered of, you know, uh, material and historical value, at least half of that has got to have come about by metal detecting but it's got to be responsible metal detecting so that phrase that i used at the beginning archaeo detectorist 
uh, that is someone who can be trusted and can work with archaeologists. Uh, nowadays, you, you know, every dig site, you know, especially the commercial ones where they're under time pressure, um, they have to use metal detectors. Um, and the guys I've met and the clubs I've been to give talks to and the discoveries that I've handled, you know, uh, you meet guys who can tell the difference between two different kinds of whistles that sound the same to me. But, you know, they can go, oh, yes, that's iron, you know, and then they go, and, they go, and that one's bronze, you know, and, and that one's 10 inches down, but that one's probably only an inch down, you know. You're like, okay, these guys are professionals, they are experts, you know. So, I mean, as archaeologists, I, I can't see the sense in not using people with skills that are as keen as that, you know. So, I suppose I am a big supporter. I'm a big supporter of technology and a big supporter of metal detecting, as long as it's responsible. And if you're going to get into metal detecting, why not just take a look at what archaeology is? You know, take your zip bags, write, write your locations on them, record your finds, record your locations. Just a bit of basic stuff, you know, enough. And I'll tell you what, if you hit a big hoard, if you really hit something valuable and you go through the official coroner system, your quid's in. Your quid's in at the end of it. So why not? Why not just give yourself that edge and start to contribute to British history? You know, that's what it's all about, really, when, when we're chasing history. So, yeah, I'm a big supporter. I'm a big fan of metal detecting. Fantastic item, uh, fantastic answer and descriptive mm. as well, Mark. It was great. And I'm sure most people, I mean, most of the most of the viewers that I know personally are responsible detectors. Yeah. yeah. There's several people on here I know are actually hoard finders, which is great. Uh, Darren Booth, I think it's Darren Booth, yeah. He found a, a hoard. I can't remember what it was at the top of me. I think it was Roman. <laughs> uh, but I know he's found it a hoard. And, yeah. and some of the other things that people have found it, I mean, Tony Kaywood put together uh, a YouTube video about how to le read LIDAR and old maps. Yeah. It was fantastic. We did a show yeah. on it. Uh, we'd done an offshoot article related to it, but the information that he was giving out was was brilliant, and, and a lot of people benefited from that, yeah. that learning. Uh, well, well, certainly in the Mersey Valley, when I did the Celtic Warrington book series, there wasn't anything like that. The knowledge wasn't there to help and assist metal detectors. Yeah. So when I did the book series, uh, and I, I went around giving talks to metal detectors, the books sold like bananas. They sold like hot cakes. Because by reading those books, you get some experience of the sort of research that you can do. Because yeah. um, it can go further than that. You can do documentary research. You can have a look at old photographs. Have a look what's in the background of black and white photos. It can tell you where things have been. You know, there's all the military photographs. There's Google Earth. You know, the list just goes on and on. There's so much out there that you can use. Even OS maps, you know, don't use the modern rubbish. Go and find the Victorian ones that tell you where all the sites are. You know, because they've taken them off the modern maps. So you know, th those kind of books and that kind of knowledge and that kind of information, absolutely invaluable. You know, it's, it's, it's like the little red cross on the treasure map. You know, this is where the treasure's buried. You know, go and have a look. You'll find it. Mark, do you have a website yourself where people can have a, garner more information? Um, what I'm going to say is I'm going to say I've always taken a personal approach. And when I have had websites in the past, they've always been manned by somebody else. So I took the decision about 15 years ago that I'm going to stick to Facebook. I know everybody hates the new format. So do I. But I'm going to stick to Facebook. If people genuinely want to find me and talk to me, then just friend me on Facebook. Every single thing I do, every photograph, every place I go, every conversation I have, Facebook and, and, and Bodies Messenger, um, you know, and if it's important, we can take it to email. We can go further from there. But I would definitely say if you want to start, you want to get a feel for me and a feel for what I do. There's thousands of photographs on my Facebook. I've tried to keep everything up to date. I run it like a website um, and it's got the personal touch. There you go. Da -da, come and find me. At the moment, I'm ranting and raving about COVID. Don't let that put you <laughs> off. Um, you know, I'm kind of, I think I'm kind of saying what everybody wants to say. But for some reason, everybody else gets blocked. But touch wood, I don't. So, you know, um, if you want to have a good moan or whatever or send me more information about stuff, that is definitely the place to go. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Technology Guy, for finding that. <laughs> it's good that is all, Luke. Uh, one one other guy. thing as well. I don't know anybody else that has done this for as long as you personally have, have done this. 
and it's phenomenal. And it's the door. Uh, oh, wow. You know, your open door policy, more or less. Uh, yeah. Meetings at home, yeah, which you've yeah. had as long as I've known you on a, a monthly basis. Yes. Um, every What we used to do, we used to meet every Monday, the first Monday of the month. Uh, sorry, the first Monday of the uh, of every week we used to meet. We used to have 50-odd meetings a year. But it got far too much when I was doing television to keep that up. Um, obviously, I've relocated. I'm at a different address now. So we've actually not had any meetings at this new address because we've gone into lockdown. Um, but we will, in the new year, hopefully resume meeting on the first Monday of the month. Um, and it is an open door. It's called The Door. Uh, it's histories, mysteries and discoveries. So there's always a topic. Um, it's got um, all kinds of themes, everything, you know, from herbs and witchcraft and wizardry and, you know, ancient beliefs and archaeology and, oh, you name it, you know, Loch Ness Monster, spoon bending, UFOs, you know, bring whatever, you know, uh, as, as long as everybody's open to, you know, not sort of arguing and fighting and being disagreeable with each other. Uh, hopefully that'll start up again in the new year. In the new year, in June, we are 25. We are 25 years wow. old. Um I think over the years, we, we, we spread over seven counties, and at one point we had about 750 members or something. I mean, you've got to bear in mind these are in the days before the internet and before social media, uh, when people actually used to come together and meet in the real world and talk to each other face to face. Uh, so we're kind of trying to keep that going. So, yes, we have a slightly bigger venue here now as well. We can probably take up to 30 or 40 people, but that's kind of worked against us in the pandemic because obviously we can't, yeah. um, you know. But, yes, we're still going. We're still here. Um, you know, if you want to know more, yeah, have a chat with me on Facebook and message me. Um, you have to do really... a, a Zoom, a door Zoom. <laughs> well, I, it kind of defines the object. I've had so many people say to me, why don't you take the door on to, you know, Zoom or whatever. And But you've got to meet face to face. You yeah. know, there's no substitute for the face to face, the physical contact. So um, it's not killed us. It's just kind of put us into hibernation. But, you know, the opportunity to come back next year with the 25th anniversary, I mean, you know, we're absolutely chomping at the bit. Um, so there probably will be a relaunch and that will definitely go right across social media via Facebook. And, you know, all, all the people will pyramid sell it like they always do. Uh, so you will get to hear about that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not the kind of, you know, pop star or television personality that likes to hide. You know, uh, also, I give talks, you know, as you mentioned earlier on, if people want to book me for a, a society or whatever, you know, once we get going again, please contact me via Facebook. Um, I can give you my email and we can start looking at me coming out. I think I've got 37 uh, live PowerPoints, three of which are centered on lost treasures. Um, and they cover history right from, you know, prehistory right the way through to UFO crashes. You know, there's going to be something on there. I can send you a list anyway. So, yeah, oh, well, very much so. I'm just chomping at the bit. I want to go out there and meet people again. <laughs> well, you know, if if you're ever in the position, when we are in the position to to do that again, and you want me to come up and talk crap, I can certainly do that. <laughs> oh, I'd, be, I'd certainly be delighted. <laughs> I've got a number of subjects that I've I've got myself in that I've obviously because I used to do uh, the Rexham Science Festival, as you know, I used yeah, to do yeah. talks there. Uh, yeah. And throughout the UK, in different areas, I've done different talks. Uh, I probably won't touch upon the subject matter that I've done in the past, but uh, things can be tailored to suit. And obviously, oh, I'd be so delighted you give me a that. shout, and you know, I'll, I'll, you know, for a fact, I'll, yeah, I'll do anything. You're up and running. If you're doing yeah, any filming on. where you need a metal detectorist, <laughs> or if you've got any sites that you're looking at and you need somebody with a metal detector, again, you know where exactly where I am. I'm only yeah, half an hour away, and I'm more than willing to help out. You've done. So much for me in the past that I'm oh, uh, obviously grateful for. Then you know I'm, I'm I'm I want to give back, which I do with a lot of people that they they know about. So uh, just, just give me a shout anytime. So absolutely, you're going to regret that next year. Cause no, I, I certainly won't. I won't. <laughs> so, uh, Mark, before we we wind up for the evening, is there anything okay. else you'd like to add? Uh, give any more information? Any bits and bobs? I've pretty well covered the advertising. Uh, it would be nice if, if, like I said, if Iconic got a decent number of hits for the Avery episode, the uh, the Walking Britain series that they've done. Um, you know, don't hold it against them. It's it's David's sons, so you know they're, they're a little <laughs> bit more down to earth. Uh, it is a proper. Hey, there you go. Well done. I believe they're running like a week's free trial as well, so you can get on there for a week, suck it and see, see what you think. Um, you can watch me and then maybe stay with them. Um, I think the whole idea of the channel is to try to improve uh, what's coming out in terms of media, 
uh, to help people, to improve people, to, you know, educate people. Uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, I've got to put myself behind something like that because there's not a lot of stuff like that on the Internet. Um, you know, I've been on the Internet now for a long, long, long time. And, uh, yeah, I can definitely say get, get behind this iconic and try and support it. Um, I know David's got his own particular way of carving out his unique uh, viewpoint on life. But as I say, this goes a lot further than that. This is broader. Uh, there's a lot of good people on there, you know, um, and I am working directly with with his sons. So if you get a chance to go and watch that, please do. That's that's well worth a plug. Um, plus the fact they might actually employ me and use me again. <laughs> You know, I like um, the fact you were so polite about David Icke. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I can't fault him for some of the things he comes out with, but some of the things he comes out with would be better said, I think, if he put some history and context behind them. You know, he's very famous for certain misquotes, but if you actually do the research, the historical side of it, there is something behind it, you know. Uh, there were lizard people in the depictions in ancient Babylon, you know what I mean? Um, and in the Bible, it says in the Old Testament, and Jesus himself says, we are all gods with a small g. So, you know, if somebody puts something in context, where they're getting, where they're getting their information from. That's the catch, actually, isn't it? You know, that's the catch. But, you know, if, you, if you're on television and you don't have a sympathetic interviewer like yourself, you know, um, they, they will tear strips off you if you don't back things up. I think David in his early days learned that very, very quickly. Um, but, yeah. OK, I'm working with his sons. His sons are brilliant. They're fab. So, well, I know, know my, uh, my, my colleague in the production area will be <laughs> certainly probably looking at that site because he uh, he likes a bit of things like that, as, yeah. as I mentioned earlier. So, well, it's, Mark, not all, it's not all David Icke-isms either. A lot of it is kind of helpful stuff. Yeah. You know, it's, it, there's meditation on there. There's yoga on there. There's all kinds of community stuff on there. So, yeah, have there you, you go. Have you seen me? I can't do yoga. <laughs> I've tried doing the plank and it's, I'm just a plank. <laughs> well, that, that's that's the closest I get to yoga, okay? I don't know if you can see that, but, you know, that that's the closest I get to yoga. <laughs> I, get, I get closer to yoga. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, hey, don't, knock it, don't knock it. I can do it twice. Oh, good Lord. There you go. Look at that. Marvellous. Well, Mark, <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. As, as you know, Ever, you know, I could speak to you all night long. Uh, yeah. We've only... We've only scratched the surface uh, of of your career. Uh, you know, we've not talked about a lot of things, and, and I'm sure a lot of people would like you to return in the future. Uh, I'd be delighted. So, and we we can we can yeah. look at a totally different area than what I've only spoke tonight about the areas that I've been privy to personally. Well, have, uh, have a look at the questions that people send in. Build another episode around those. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And again, if anybody wants to contact me. Uh, for things that they would like to uh, talk about with Mark, get in contact with me and ask that. And obviously, yeah. if you want to speak to Mark, find him on uh, Facebook, Mark Ollie. Yeah. You've get seen him little at, and uh, yeah, you'll you'll chat away. away. He's got he's got loads of time at the minute in lockdown. <laughs> Happy Christmas, everybody! Merry yeah. Christmas, Mark. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, I'm st we we were supposed to have in another massive guest, but unfortunately. Due to their commitments at the moment, uh, we, we've got to be coming in a new year with that show. Uh, so I think we've got, well, we've got another guest lined up. I just haven't confirmed with him yet. Uh, so that'll be on the 24th. No, it won't. It'll be on the 23rd. So next week we'll actually be on Wednesday because we don't want to be getting people bothered on Christmas Eve, do we? Uh, the following week, again, we'll be broadcasting on Wednesday due to it being New Year's Eve on the Thursday. And I won't be doing anything but eating on New Year's Eve anyway. And on that edition, it's uh, coming together with The Search magazine and Treasure Hunting magazine, Dan Spencer and Julian Evan Hart. And we will be reviewing the major finds uh, and the best finds of, of each um, company, uh, each magazine, and looking at them, going through them, talking about them, and other highlights of the year. And, and yes, um, Tony K. Woods just reminded me that we do have an app. The Archaeology and Metal Detecting magazine is available on Play Store. Uh, so go and have a look at that. It's free. All the information's on there. You can watch every back episode of The Big Detecting Show uh, all the way from the very start. They're, they're all on there, so you can see them at any time. Plus, Arc MD Mag 
TV, which is our version of Netflix. And there's lots of things in there from documentaries to YouTubers, uh, to archaeology, metal detecting, Roman Viking, etc., etc. And Mark's in there somewhere as well, the episode of the uh, the Winnick episode of uh, Lost Treasures. So, again, I bid you adieu. Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. And uh, have a very Merry Christmas to you and your all. You. And yeah. I, will, uh, I will speak to you tomorrow on Messenger to give you some information and link you up with certain people. Please do. Take care, Mark. Watch this space. (laughs) Watch that space. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Right, it's early o'clock. I'm out again. I'm at the beach. Not normal beach, different one. I've travelled. I've met up a couple of guys from the Peaky Finders. There's a couple of them up. Got, got Lee and Gary, Mr. Spoons. And further down the beach, we've got Tony and uh, Graham. I can't remember the other guy's name, it eludes me at the moment. <laughs> Get away from Gary. Right, so, we are, where am I, uh, Seaford, so it's a bit of a steep beach, tide's just going out, see the sand down there, We've got a harbour wall along there, I don't know if it's going to be any good or not, I don't know, but yeah, we're about to start, and we'll see you on the first hole. Alright, well, we'll get that out of the way, that's the first one, the obligatory fish and weight, wouldn't be a, a hunt if we didn't find one there, mate. One's a bit different. 19. Yeah. Looks like a squid, doesn't it? <laughs> That's pretty cool. Got a hook in it. <laughs>